So there's three pieces that you would look for if somebody's really starting to show attraction. And I talk about that being, a, it's almost like having x-ray vision. That's the micro expression of a disgust. That's the no face. So if you say, do you want to come home with me? She does that. No, she doesn't. It's going to be the same thing in business. If I say a pitch and you and I are talking about opening a business together and I say, I think we start with an initial injection of $10 million and your pupils go, ding, I've got you in the palm of my hand. If you and I are in a romantic situation or really good friends, when I sit down with somebody I'm close to, I'm going to start moving all like the candle and the flowers and all the things off to the side. People do that automatically. And so if the date is going well, you might see her starting to move that she's not going to be aware of it at all. And the opposite is true. If you sit with a colleague that you really dislike, people will start moving things in between you. People sometimes will ask me, what is the one thing that you really were surprised when you could sort of take away that veil and you got the x-ray vision of reading microexpressions? I was like, oh shit, everybody's struggling. So first of all, why is it important to be able to read microexpressions? Why is that a skill that, that we should be able to learn? Microexpressions are the very deepest of listening skills. And they, they're the deepest of listening skills because we can tell exactly what someone is feeling in the exact moment that they're feeling it. So if you care about what someone else is experiencing, then microexpressions are phenomenally important. And what made you look into microexpressions? Why, why is this something that you, you mastered? Um, so I grew up in a difficult household. I had a hard childhood. And what we know as, is that kids that have experienced trauma tend not to put away their ability to read facial expressions. That really all neurotypical babies scan faces as they're trying to figure out like tick, 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 tick. And we're actually trained out of that around the age of two, depending on the culture. But we get from our parents, look me in the eyes when I speak to you, look me in the eyes. And we lose our ability to gauge what's going on with other people just by their facial, facial movements. It's a biological, hardwired thing, both to read facial expressions and to make them. So why is that a thing that we that we lose that ability at a young age? Do you know Do you know exactly why? Well, we're tra I don't know exactly why, but we're really as soon as we as soon as we start looking some. So I'm looking you in the eyes right now, and when I make all these micro expressions, so I'm gonna look me in the eyes and I'm gonna make some micro expressions: vulnerability, anger, oh crap, which is fear. You you miss them. Disgust. Okay, now look at my mouth area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can see them if you're paying attention and you're waiting for them. But it's almost like we forgot, you know, it's almost like baby talk. This is the the visual baby talk mm. that we've somehow forgotten. And one of the really things, really important things that I teach every time I teach is that this is a, something that's hardwired into us as a species. It has nothing to do with culture, age, ethnicity, gender, location, ge you know, geography, so socialization, even people who are born blind and have never seen another human being, they make the same facial expressions. Wow. And I also know that you did a lot of traveling. Um, yeah, and so I, it's, it's the same across cultures. Across, so I have a master's in anthropology. So, like, you know, I'm very skilled at recognizing cultural differences. And my expectation was that that's what I was going to work with. And so it's sort of the irony of my life that I've lived in nine countries, including the U.S., I lived abroad for 25 years, so eight additional countries, and I studied um, eight languages, most of them through immersion. So I, I spent years and years of my life just being totally clueless mm. as to what other people are thinking and, and or what other people are saying. So I had to watch people's faces. And I've had long romantic relationships with men that I don't understand. So out of body language, so someone's body language, tone of voice, or micro expressions, what tells more most about how someone's feeling? In the, in the, the micro expressions are very, very specific and scientific. Okay. Body language and don't vary. So everybody has certain micro expressions, and I can teach you some of those. Um, are relay a specific feeling, clear as day. Body language varies from person to person, from culture to culture. Body language you have to have a, like a lot of context and interpretation and guessing. 
I can tell exactly what someone is feeling by their micro expressions. If they cross their arms, I don't know. Like, are you defensive? Could be. You could also be cold. You could be Norwegian. You know, the Finns, yeah. the Norwegians, the Germans, all the Northern Europeans, they tend to sit more they're, they're closed than, than, than Americans do. And, it, you know, it could just be that you're a little uncomfortable in the moment, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're hostile. If you're with your girlfriend and you're, and you're arguing and she goes, well, con <laughs> contextually, yeah. probably she's pissed. Yeah. So, so voice um, also, like, my throat gets tight. You'll hear as we keep talking, my throat's going to loosen. Mm. As soon as I get really into my subject, I soften and relax and, and get lost in it. I get into that flow because I love it so much. And something I've heard you say is that, um, so when you read someone's micro expressions, it's not that, so you say that you know what they're feeling, but you don't know why they're right. feeling that, correct? Right. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little bit of example. When human beings, when our hand, when we get scared, our hands get cold. This is my like regular spiel. And uh, the blood runs down to our legs and our feet so we can run. When we're angry, the blood pumps into our fists so that we can fight. When we're nervous, we sweat in our armpits, the, you know, on our brows, on the palms of our hands. Human beings are sad, we cry. These are biological responses. When we human beings are aroused, the blood pools in the middle of the body, right? So you've talked to Matthew, right, who works on my PR team? Yes. Yeah. So he sent me, I, I did a daytime television show and they sent me like the call sheet and on the call sheet was this, and you can edit this out if you need to, was everything that I had to do and where I was supposed to show up and the timing. And then in big red block letters, you are not allowed to say erections on daytime television. <laughs> You really? You're really? Yeah. Okay. And I was like, okay, but then like after six, can you say it in evening television? Like, is there a time where like once you get past dinner, you're let? But the reason that they said that is that I often will say when I'm teaching that microexpressions are as universal as erections. Yeah. When we are aroused, the blood flows to the middle of our body and we would not be able to survive as a species or we wouldn't have survived as a species were this not true. Mm. And that's where all the men, the men in the room are like, oh crap, I have a change in blood flow and muscle movement specific to a specific emotion. I don't get an erection because I'm sad or because I'm angry. And if you do, that's above my pay grade. You have to. <laughs> but that's when it starts to click that we have a physiological response to each emotion that varies mm. in our bodies and on our faces. And arousal in our faces is a dilation of the pupils. Once you learn that, it's clear as day. So if you think a naked man in front of me, I know he's aroused. A hundred percent I know the feeling and the emotion that he's feeling aroused. I do not know if he's thinking about me. Exactly. Right? He may be yeah. thinking about the gal during, down the street or the guy at his office or I have no idea. I am not a mind reader. But I can tell that he is aroused just as clearly as I can tell that somebody is aroused when their pupils dilate. Mm. Could you tell I was a little nervous before we started? Yeah. I'm, I'm always a little nervous before I, every, every podcast. But, but so am I. Of course. You know, yeah. it doesn't it – doesn't, I mean, it helps to a certain degree to read what other people are feeling, but it doesn't stop you from feeling your own feelings. Mm. And so my – the difference for me is I can say, oh, you know, Brian's a little nervous. Oh, good. I'm nervous too. And then I can kind of be like, we're both a little nervous and we'll get through this together. Yes. And, and I think it's also, but to reemphasize, you don't know exactly why I'm nervous. No. To be honest, I was a little nervous about the setup, about the cameras. No, it's because I'm so beautiful <laughs> <laughs> and charming. And you're like, I can't wait to meet Annie. Of course you are. You know, and that all of those things are so, I mean, humanity is lovely. The fact that we get nervous um, shows that we are invested and we care about the situation. We care mm -hmm. about the people around us. We want to perform well for ourselves, for our families, for each other. Um, and we're, we're invested. That's, that's a lovely thing. Exactly. So you, uh, you, you started by teaching your kids how to read micro expressions, correct? Yeah. So I got obsessed with it fairly early. I was gaslighted a lot as a kid and I was told everything that I saw didn't happen. I mean, it, you, there were things that were done to me that a week later it was like, that didn't happen. So there was a, a in some of the people that were in caregiving roles, there was a delusion and there was, this is a difficult reality and we will not, I mean, you you have some experience in your in your profession, yes, right? Yeah. Where people are like, nope, didn't happen. That's an uncomfortable truth. I'm not going to deal with that. What would that say about me if that got out into society that I allow that to happen on my watch mm. to a child? And so there was this disconnect in my 
life about what had happened and and who was supposed to keep me safe. And when I started to realize I was pretty young, I want to I want to say I don't really remember how old I was, maybe 10, maybe 12 when I first heard about facial expressions being scientific and people being able to read that. And then it kind of didn't I didn't think about it much until I started learning languages. I got a rotary scholarship when I was 16 and went away on an exchange program to Sweden. And you know, just was fiercely determined to learn Swedish. So I put away my English because everybody said, you can't learn another language when you're 16. Swedish is a really difficult language. And I thought, watch me. Hmm. You know, the I, I would guess that you're kind of similar in this way, that if somebody tells you Absolutely. something can't be done, you're like, bring it. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. I can, like, that I could read from the first second. Mm-hmm. That this, you've got a certain determination about you. Yeah. And a certain, this is going to be difficult and maybe other people can't do it, but but wait a second, I'm going to figure it out. you know. And you are nervous and you are intimidated and there were certain pieces with the technology mm-hmm. that you haven't done before that we're doing today. Yes. And that's not stopping you. Yes. Yeah. And so I'm very similar. I was like, okay, so if I'd been born in Sweden or I'd been born in Japan, I would have learned those languages. Just like I, if I could learn English and I can speak fluent English, I must have the ability. So in my brain, I thought, well, like, I have to recreate this baby environment. So if I just put away the English and don't think in English anymore, then certainly there'll be space in my brain for my Swedish. So if I just kind of shove that over to the side. So I refuse to speak any English, which is kind of ridiculous. But I, I more or less obliterated my previous life. Hmm. And I learned Swedish really <laughs> well. And I flirted a lot. And that, um, you know, you have to figure out what motivates you. But talking to to really beautiful, charming Swedish boys, I was focused on understanding what they were saying. And I was focused on reading their their expressions and their body language and figuring out what stuck and what didn't. And it took, you know, it, it took a while to learn a foreign yeah. language. And then I did the same with with French and with Spanish and to a certain degree with with Mandarin and with Mallorquin and with a bunch of other languages. So speaking of flirting, yes. let's say that I'm on a date mm-hmm. and I can kind of tell this person might not be that interested. How can I tell with their uh, micro expressions? So the micro expressions, I, when I talk about flirting, there's three pieces of seeing if they're interested. And if they're not doing any of this, they're, they may not be interested. They may also just be nervous. So we need to leave some space for people being stuck in themselves, in their own headspace, in their own heart space. So much of what I do with, with both my private life and my professional life is trying to make other people feel really comfortable. And sometimes that's just showing my own vulnerability. Hmm. Um, so the more you can show a little bit of vulnerability, the more it makes it okay. Like if you tell me you're nervous, then it's okay for me to tell you I'm nervous. Mm. And I think for women in particular in today's dating world, they're desperate for some authenticity and for somebody being real and not just trying to smooth talk them and not just trying to manipulate them, but just actually saying like, Hey, this is me. Mm. Um, so there's three pieces that you would look for if somebody's really starting to get show attraction. And I talk about that being above the eyes, in the eyes, and under the eyes. Okay? So above the eyes, and this took me forever to figure out how to code, what we call bedroom eyes is like we half-mast our eyelids. We let them slip down our eyelids. And we just, we often, women in particular, will often show our necks. Mm. So as soon as they like have that little bit of a head tilt, there's also, I mean, that typical thing that women will just kind of showcase what they've got so any kind of this movement where i'm in some way making my features whether my lips or my neck or my bosom like more prominent that's showing an indication but if you think about the eyelids i think about like kind of pulling down the shades to make the setting more romantic i like to teach and i like to make things simple so that's above the eyes. That's that sort of, you know, dipping the eyelids. And you'll notice that a lot of the um, actors and actresses that we're really obsessed with, they will sometimes have that those eyelids that give that, um, I think about uh, the woman um, on Grey's Anatomy. 
uh, Shep, her last name's Shepard, Dr. Shepard, the one, not Meredith, but the other one, um, Addison. And she has these gorgeous eyelids that she's using all the time to kind of get that sort of seductive look. Then we have the dilation of the pupils. And the way we figure that out is by looking and gauging the size. You feel so, you feel so watched right now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. This is okay. Yes, I'm not so. judgmental at all. <laughs> so, so you gauge the, the size of the pupils at the beginning of the meeting. Because we know that pupils can be, uh, they swell when, when it's dark. They contract when it's super light out. Um, medication or just sort of natural size of that one kid where her pupils are always more dilated than my other kids, lighter eyes are going to have often a bigger dilation. So you're looking for the change. Any kind of micro expressions, you're looking for the, the change. So did you say something or do something that made that person's pupil swell. And because we do this, like looking in, in someone's eyes and then looking away and then doing all that, we need to remember how big they were when they start. Because you might miss that mo catching the moment they swell is hard, but realizing, oh shit, now they're twice as big. Yes. That's much easier. And it's, it's tough. It's tough to, I mean, I would love to hear your opinion on this. I feel like that's very tough though, when like you're just walking into a first date, because I feel like you have a million other things yeah. and you're not really thinking consciously. So the, consciously. So the way you're going to train yourself to do it is the same way that if you were going to go to like a bat mitzvah or a wedding or something and you're going to dance, you learn the dance steps ahead of time. You're not going to try that new dance move for the first time. In public. And so if every time you sit down with somebody, you start training yourself, like, how big are this pe person's pupils? Because it's going to be the same thing in business. If I say a pitch and you and I are talking about opening a business together and I say, I think we start with an initial injection of $10 million and your pupils go, ding, I've got you in the palm of my hand. Mm. And that that doesn't mean that you're attracted to me. That means that you're really interested. I want, I want, I want, give me, give me, give me. So the pupil dilation only shows, I want that now. And if you're on a date, hopefully it's you that they want, yes. right? Yep. And if you're in a business situation, hopefully it's the deal that you've just pitched. So, I mean, you can do it with like your family members, the people, and you just, when you have face-to-face -face meetings, just get used to, okay, pupils, check. Hmm. That's it. Now, how do we tell if, is there anything that they show in their face or their body language when they just want to get the hell out of there and they're not, they're I, not about it? I, not about I feel it. like people will sit back. They'll remove themselves from this position. That in and of itself doesn't mean negative, but if people keep trying to get away from you, hmm. That that's a problem. We we when we like something, we want to touch it. We want to get close to it. So touching somebody, leaning in, making ourselves more accessible is important. The other thing that's really interesting is that there's um, when it comes to body language. If you and I are in a romantic situation or really good friends. When I sit down with somebody I'm close to, I'm going to start moving all like the candle and the flowers and all the things off to the side. People do that automatically. And so if the date is going well, you might see her starting to move that she's not going to be aware of it at all. Wow. And the opposite is true. If you sit with a colleague that you really dislike, I, I see my you like make like Trump and build a wall. People will start moving things in between you. Hmm. They'll start opening a computer and popping up the screen to put it between them and somebody else. And it's the funniest thing to watch. It's almost like a little kid building a barrier to like, I don't like you. And so if you're in a board, I see people in board meetings do it all wow. the time where they're like, I don't really want you in my space. So I'm going to make a barrier here. So are you making the barrier or are you removing it? And you're saying that's like innate. Like we do that without yeah. even realizing yeah, it. Yeah. That's fascinating. It is. It's that's crazy. And it's so fun. And then the other thing is that when we're aligned and connected and things are going well, we mirror each other's uh, facial expressions. But the easiest thing to see is mirroring somebody's body language. And that can be – that just means like there's an us. Hmm. There's a we. And so we, do, we notice that even animals do it. Um, so my work with the facial expressions is really based on a lot of the work that Darwin started to categorize. And it wasn't that he made it up. It was that he noticed it. Hmm. And he started to write about facial expressions. But one of the things we animals and people do when we feel like we're connected to an individual or a group is we sit in the same way. They lean forward, we'll lean forward. We, they lean back, we lean back. They put one arm up, we put one arm up. And you can do it as a way to flirt or you can do it even in a job interview to, way, to make the other person feel a little connected. Wow. 
when it when it comes to flirting, um, I feel like men struggle with this a lot. Is kind of having a hard time telling the difference when someone's flirting with you or just being nice. Just being nice. What's that? What's that expression when they're just being nice over over flirting? Okay, so. Um... The flirting, remember, like the above the eyes, in the eyes, the under the eyes. The under eyes I didn't mention, that's when your cheeks pop up. So genuine joy in a human has nothing to do with a smile. Hmm. If we're happy, our cheeks rise up of their own accord. They lose gravity. And this flat skin bulges out. So you can ignore the cheeks and just see, like, do I have smile bags? Hmm. And so that's part of flirtation. Like, do, do you make me feel good and happy when we're together? Okay. So that's that piece. So somebody just being like kind of deadpan and neutral and not invested. So those are the pieces of arousal. That's the that's the like romantic like I'm interested. Now what I look for when I see if somebody's emotionally attached is whether or not the chin puckers. And that the chin puckers in empathy, compassion, sadness, uh, love, both romantic and for children. And so basically, the more you can get my chin puckered, the more I'm connecting with you on an emotional level. Mm. Now, for that to happen, usually there has to be a little bit of vulnerability displayed. People do not understand that vulnerability is the the kryptonite. Like that's the the juice of the romance and the attachment and the connection. Um and, and so this piece of allowing yourself to be seen, that's the only way we kind of find our people. But to, to really see if a woman is open and available, you got to ask her. Okay. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that what what is so, even with, you know, I have two daughters, one's 21 and one, uh, 22 now, and uh, one's 19, and I mean, we talk about this with their friends all the time, how lovely it is for a man who just says straight what he wants hmm. in a kind way. You know, not not a gimme, 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 but um, one of my daughters has a boyfriend and she says, you know, he's just so direct. He didn't play any games. He just said, look, I would really like to spend time with you. I bet the people's. Oh, my God. <laughs> She's like, Mom, this is phenomenal. And so kind and vulnerable and lovely mm. and I think too many of us are, are playing games that even at my age I'm a single woman even at my age at 52 where you know I'm divorced and second time around the things that are that the, the men that are interesting are the people that are authentic and real and and tell the truth you know we're flawed messy wonky human beings and the only way we can really find if it's a good connection is if we're honest about who we are. So a lot of guys say when when maybe something falls through with a girl, they say, but she smiled at me or she did this. So but what I'm saying, yeah. but what I'm saying is you should look for that, um, the yeah. eye bags. Yeah. So yeah. is it possible to smile without? So you smile without those eye bags. It's almost like fake. Yeah, it's really uncomfortable. It really yeah. likes that's here. And watch me do. OK, so another piece is if she's uncomfortable. She's going to show her nostril shadows. What do you mean by that, nostril shadows? So this is the facial expression of disgust that all babies make. We all, you know, we humans make that when something smells bad. We don't want to eat it. It's a no face. I don't want to. It's got three pieces, wrinkle here, the deepening of the nasal labial furrow, and the lift of the upper lip. So we all have that, like, seventh grade girls, like, really? <laughs> And so there's this piece of um, – so that's the macro. The micro expression precedes the thought process. It's involuntary. And we don't often know that we're making it. Hmm. That's the micro expression of a disgust. That's the no face. So if you say, do you want to come home with me? She does that. No, she doesn't. And again, that may not be that she hates you. That may just be like, oh, my God, I – can't and I or I'm feeling pressured but it's a no hmm. that's the no clear as day so anytime she's lifting her nasal labial furrow which that's why I just call it the nostril shadows nostril shadows are easy to remember yeah if she has shadows right here that's something is making her uncomfortable now watch when I try to mask that with a smile it's still really uncomfortable now, I think I, this is something fascinating that I heard you say is that it also when you make that face of disgust it also blocks the airways right yeah up to about 80% you can't smell something it's our yeah. body's response to no 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 don't come in here it's no 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 yeah. and again we don't know why the um, why it's a no face so I ha sometimes have my 
my students actually look up those clips of Jimmy Fallon. You know, he, he does a he does a sketch where it's like, oh, and he pretends to be this seventh grade girl or teenage girl. He goes, oh, that's so gross. Oh, but it's a great that sort of watching the same facial expression go on and off. We call it onset and offset on the face over and over really trains your brain so that you can see it when you want to. But if you're in a negotiation, whether it's romance or whether it's business, and you're looking at someone's face and you're saying like, well, what do you think about this? And they, that's just a no. Hmm. And you can ask, you can say, you know, is there something that would you rather do? So, you know, if, if you're saying like, let's, let's, um, let's go eat hamburgers tonight. And that person goes, is there something you'd rather do? So it may, may just be like they got hamburgers last night or they got pizza last night. They don't want to tonight. Hmm. So again, what they're feeling or not what they're thinking. And you can repeat that. But if every time you talk to someone about spending time with them and they're doing that, they probably don't want to spend time with you. It, I mean, it's, it's important to know this stuff because it saves you more pain in the long term, right? Yeah. Um, before you get emotionally attached or, mm -hmm. or before you commit more time to it. I feel like a lot of people struggle at telling when someone's actually interested in them or not. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people struggle with that, um, especially – I feel like especially men too. Right. Yeah. And you can ask. Mm. A lot of people don't do that, no, especially my age. Because we're so scared of getting hurt. And yeah. yet, you know, my daughter's experience of, of having somebody who said, like, I really like you. I'd like to spend time with you. Is there a way we can, like, you know, and, and leave it open and not just – he didn't keep going at her with, can you do it this time? Can you do it that time? He left it open. I would like – I like you. I would like to spend time with you. I feel like – but there's a narrative for – especially um, with men that – it's like, don't be needy. Don't show your true feelings. Like, try to stay stoic. And, and... Men are so needy. So yeah. very, very needy because we're humans. We're mm -hmm. all humans, and humans are needy. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, isn't that what we want, though? Somebody that we can be needy with? We don't want to be, we don't want somebody to feel sorry for us. I mean, I don't, I, I have a lot of pride. I hate it when people feel sorry for me. But to be vulnerable with somebody and to connect with somebody, I mean, that's a beautiful, that's what we're all looking for, or yeah. we should be all looking for, unless we, you know, unless we've got so much damage and so much trauma that we just, that we just can't. Do you have any stories or examples of when you were maybe on a date and you saw maybe a red flag based on, based oh, on a, um, their yeah. facial expressions? Yeah. yeah. So, um, when I'm looking for lying or for ill intentions, I'm always looking for the disconnect with the facial expressions and the words. So somebody's saying, I'm, I'm really happy to see you while they're doing the no face. No, they're not. Hmm. I mean, it's just that's what like I my scale, the thing I'm really good at is taking this really sort of advanced, complicated science and putting into words that make sense because this is stuff we, we kind of already know in our in our primitive brain because it is wired into us. Yeah. And so if somebody is telling me all these wonderful things, they shouldn't be making distasteful expressions. Now, if somebody is saying, I hate broccoli or, you know, I had a hard childhood and they're showing disgust, that matches. You know, you really don't like broccoli and that was something that was hard for you that felt unfair or uncomfortable. And so those are red flags for me. Somebody being ridiculously invested in every single thing I do makes me nervous. Hmm. So somebody who's interested in microexpressions, great, we connect. But somebody who's done so much research that every single thing I do is amazing to them, that makes me nervous because where's their personality? Where's, I mean, you and you and I were talking, you immediately started talking about like, I'd like to get a new, I, this camera works great, but I'd like to get a new camera. I've been thinking about getting this kind of equipment. You're bringing your interests to the table. You're not just having a conversation based on my interests. Mm -hmm. You're coming as a full human being and talking about your business, your life, your things, and I get to talk about mine, and then we find which things we connect with. That's good. That's healthy. That's normal. If you came into a dating situation and only are obsessed with every single thing that she obsessed, is obsessed with in a way that feels too good to be true or vice versa. She's only interested in the things you're interested in. That's a red flag for sure. Is there a part of that that's showing like not being authentic? Because yes. like you almost like fake being really like interested in what they're saying. Right. 
It's almost like you're acting a little bit, right? It's like you're acting, and why are you not showing up as who you are? Why why do you have to pretend, and what do you do? I mean, that's, you know, narcissists, what, that's the phase of love bombing, which is this initial, let's make this connection so amazing, so off the charts, incredible, so that you've never experienced anything like it, and then I have you in the palm of my hand, mm. where you're attached way too quickly. I mean, what we do want is not to get obsessive over who we want the other person to be. We actually want to get to know somebody. If we're in a healthy place ourselves and we're looking for a long-term relationship with with another healthy human being, we we need to allow it to take a little bit of time to get to know somebody without sort of projecting back and forth. We mm. we it's more of a it's more of a show and tell. Yeah. And something you mentioned earlier about um showing vulnerability, I find that Sometimes the second I show some vulnerability, it's like the floodgates open. And like you can tell right off the bat that they're a lot more comfortable. So the much second, more comfortable. The second, the second you say something personal about yourself or or are vulnerable, yes. how, how soon should we uh, get vulnerable? Should it be right away or should it be? I, I mean, I like it right away, but look at what I do. Yeah. So, of course, like, of course I do. And it it makes me feel safe. Because especially if you're showing up as, as, you know, showing some vulnerability and showing who you – anytime I feel like you're showing me who you really are as a person, that's going to make me feel safe to show you who I really am. And then we figure out if we connect. Hmm. You know, platonically, business, professionally, romantically, like that's how people find each other. If we show up as someone else, then that person is showing up as somebody else, plastic, poised, and polished – how the hell are we going to know if we're a fit or not? Yeah. Because everybody's just showing this weird kind of plastic version of themselves. How do we know? Like, if you really want human connection, you want somebody who's kind of dorky and silly and, like, real. Do you know who Dr. Bruce Lipton is? Mm -mm. So I, I just had him on on um, beginning of December. It's not out yet. But something that he mentioned was that that's what's tough about dating apps is that you're kind of projecting this perfect version of yourself. Yeah. I'm flawless, no flaws yeah. at all. And then when when you meet end up meeting that person, you realize that they're a human being. There's that there's that almost like a letdown. Um, yeah. Versus, for example, in and when you were growing up or when my parents are growing up, it, it was more of that like in person right away. You can kind of see there. Well, the other thing is like. <laughs> This, this sounds so dark, but I have a friend who's always told me, and he's so spot on, and he's like, yeah, you know, he's he's married now, but he's like, oh, my God, Annie, you have no idea this woman smells so good. And I said, yeah, that was the problem with the Swiss detective I dated in my 20s. Like, he was an ass, but, man, he smelled good. <laughs> like, you know, and he, he was my salsa partner in Spain. So, you know, like, I, there's something chemical about romance, mm. and there should be a chemical piece. There should be this piece of... Like I look at you, I am around you. You you make my insides tingle. There there needs to be some physical attraction if you're going to have a lasting relationship. Now that can ebb and flow, but at least it needs to be there. That seed of it needs to be there if you're going to be able to refine it as you have a longer relationship. But I it's this this idea of presenting ourselves almost like we're going for a job interview. It 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 really messes with our heads afterwards. Mm. I also feel like when it comes to the other person too, it's you're almost creating a false expectation of yourself that, and they, because that's what we do. We create right. stories about what we think someone is like versus what they're actually like. Yeah. And that's the problem with dating apps is that you're seeing um, something he said. It was like, he's like, who am I? I'm the best person in the world. Like there's nothing wrong with me. Like when you're projecting that. Uh, yeah, I don't know any else. of those humans. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I, um, so let's put, let's put micro expressions to the side. A lot of people my age are struggling with with dating. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that that we have so much pressure from society to be good at all the things. When I mean, look, you're you're in your twenties. You're figuring things out. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're. I look back at me in my twenties, and I was like, "Oh, who let that kid make life decisions? That was a <laughs> terrible idea." And I made some really bad decisions, but I made them in private. Mm -hmm. And so this, there's, on some level, there's an awareness. I mean, I think certainly my, my girls are older than my son. My son's still in high school. But for my girls, there's an awareness that, oh, my God, people are going to fall on their face. They're going to do it publicly. So at least we know everybody falls on their face. So there's a relief in that. But there's, 
this exhaustion of always performing everywhere you are. I mean, who has the energy for that? And the amount of news that you get about people hurting, hurting and harming other humans, hurting other humans, the amount of information you get about that on a daily basis is unbearable. Mm. So I feel like it's an entire generation with anxiety and depression. Because as much as you have hopefully some good friends and family and good people around you, there's this knowledge that there's so much destruction and, and harm. And, and I don't know how any of us bear that. There's also, there's also a lot of – I feel like there's more comparison now um, for when you – in terms of relationships, um, looking at all the other people on social media with happy relationships – and what I feel like that can do is kind of create unrealistic expectations for how it's actually supposed to go. Yeah. But I mean, look, you bring up the mom in me, so you can cut this <laughs> if you want. But like, you're lovely. You're handsome. You're smart. You're ambitious. I'm not cutting that out. You're, I'm kidding. <laughs> you're, no, no. Why would you cut that out? You're kind. Like, you are going to have no problems connecting and finding someone who will love you for exactly who you are. Mm. Why the hell would you try to be anyone else? I mean, you're wonderful. Why would you even think about it? Just show up as clearly and 100% as who you are. And then hopefully the person in front of you will show up as who they are. And you'll be able to figure out, is this somebody that I can see myself with long term? Or, you know, somebody at least that I'm interested enough on a short term to kind of let it develop. But what's tough, though, is that people, sometimes people take that advice and then they do it, they're their authentic self, but then they get rejected for their authentic self. And then that can cause them to put on, put on this front. You are not going to get out of this human life without suffering. Yeah. It is just part of showing up and loving. Love it involves a very deep piece of pain. Mm. And anybody, certainly my age or above, will like look at their lives and say, we did not escape without struggle. Mm. And the struggle brings you kindness and empathy and compassion and, and knowledge, and yet yeah, hurts like hell. But what's the alternative? I mean, the alternative is you don't ever find that kind of connection. Mm. And it's it's worth it because sometimes you, you're not going to find a romantic connection with that person, but you'll realize, like, this person's funny. Yeah. This person makes me laugh through the pieces of life that suck. And so I have a lot of male friends that I have no, you know, no desire to have a romantic relationship with them. But especially now in my life that I don't have a husband, I have much more space for intimacy of somebody calling me up and saying, yeah, I ha I'm struggling with something. Let, you know, I know you won't judge me. Let me tell you what it is. And that, to me, is one of the greatest honors of my life, mm -hmm. to have people who have had rough, difficult, complicated lives be able to land on me and say, this happened to me, or I had this romantic relationship or this professional situation where I trusted somebody and they betrayed me, but I feel better because I can go to you. So we're not just building that romance or that one person. We're also building a community of people around us that we can lean on. And that the only way to find love in this lifetime is to show up as who you are. Because even if they love you, you won't ever feel really loved unless you kind of show, like, here I am, warts and all. Here's me naked, emotionally and all the other ways. Do you like what you see? And do I like what you see? What I see when, when you show up that way too? And the only way you're going to make that person safe to show up is to, to, to jump in the cold water first. Mm. And it sucks and yeah. it hurts and it burns and that's okay. I feel like a lot of people, they, instead of trying to attract the right person, they try to attract everyone. Yes. And yes. that's and yes. that's an issue. And even you, even when you think about uh, make, having friends, yeah. it's everyone's trying to be, be liked by everyone, but that's ultimately not what's gonna make you happy. Yeah. It's gonna be having those deep, meaningful connections. Yeah, and knowing so, – so there's a couple pieces. Like who has your back when you've left the room? Hmm. Who who will – you know, if somebody starts speaking about Brian and like is he – you know, yeah, yeah, I don't like him. Who's going to say, knock it off? Brian's amazing and don't you dare. Or, uh, you know, if you have a job opportunity, who's going to say, you know, I worked with Brian. He's phenomenal. He's hmm. kind. He's caring. He's smart. He's, he's creative. He's got – he's the full package – 
And like those are the people you want. You want reciprocity. You are clearly, and you've talked a little bit about your work before we even got started, you're somebody who cares deeply about other human beings Mm -hmm. and cares about making an impact and doing good and lifting other people up. And you deserve the same. Mm -hmm. You deserve that from other people. And so don't settle for less. Why would you when you've got that much to offer? You're, you're known as uh, a human lie detector. It's even on your book here, uh, yeah. diary, diary of a Human Lie Detector. Uh, how, do we, how do we tell when someone's lying to us? So we're going to look for the mismatch. So first of all, the, your gut will almost always tell you something's off. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm trying to do is to reach out to people that are in their 20s and put the science on why your gut is telling you this feels off. If your gut tells you something feels off and you can look at their face and they're saying, we would like you to to start working for us and they're growling, they're showing that no face and you should be expected, you know, nobody else is gonna promote you as fast as we are. Well, that that's a disconnect, they are lying. Hmm. When they're sh- when they're telling you those words, so if they're, if I'm talking about how great things are going to be for you, I, I should be lifting my cheeks, showing my smile bags, or at least maintaining a neutral face. But I should be showing excitement about my words. If my words are excited, my facial expressions should be excited. It's it's you know it's why in a think about it in a romantic relationship when somebody says yeah 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 I love you I love you I love you but then won't pick up the call the mm-hmm. phone when you call that's a disconnect right there's yeah. a mismatch you can feel it you can feel it yeah. right and as soon as you said you can feel it you growled right you're like I don't like that yeah and, and your friends and your friends try to tell you like hey man like you're overthinking it it's all good but i mean if your gut's telling you something else then i mean well and how often do you use that in your work to make decisions, you know, at least, or to know where to dig and when to dig, when to ask more questions. There's something off here. I need to get to the bottom of what it is. So when you notice that someone's lying, that's what you do? Is that you just go in with more questions and try to dig deeper? Yeah. I mean, or, I mean, it depends on the situation. If it's somebody that, I, like, if I'm in a, a high stakes negotiation with a client, I'll tell them, you know, this guy's lying and here's when he was lying. And they're like, oh, you know, that's a problem. So if somebody's showing, like, I use this example all the time. If you're in a mergers and acquisitions, you're buying a company and you're about to, you know, to sign the deal and you say to the person across the table, we just want to reconfirm that the technology is going to be ready. We're on track for that to be ready two months from now because otherwise we're going to lose our, you know, our market share. And the guy goes, yeah, absolutely. That's the oh crap. Hmm. Like he's telling you, yes, but he's showing like I'm worried about this. Hmm. And so you would want to say – Okay, I'd like to I'd like to talk to some of the senior technicians, or I'd like to talk to the person who's developing the te- you know the technology or whatever it is. You then find there's there's a discrepancy there. You want to ask for more, or if you're saying like I would really love to be in a committed relationship with you, are you good with being exclusive? Yeah. Oh, like that person's like that's the oh crap face. Yeah. That doesn't match mm-hmm. them showing some vulnerability while you say that. Yeah, that would be love, you know, yeah. And that chin, that chin, uh, I think you mentioned it. It's like um, it goes from a, a grape to a raisin, right? right. Yes. Yeah. So this, it's really smooth, and then it puckers. And it, um, it, it's like our achy, breaky heart, thank you, Billy Ray Cyrus, is on our chin. That's where all that, like, deep, longing, aching sadness, it's the possibility of loss. It is the word vulnerability. So if there's a piece of vulnerability in the emotion – like sadness has a piece of vulnerability, right? We're sad. We feel like something hurts. There's some vulnerability in that. Love, there's vulnerability in love. You see that all the time when people are declaring their love in like a really good movie. There's always that that pucker. Yeah. Like, because yeah. you could get hurt. You could get rejected. You could be like, this is achy. This is, there's something. And we even when we see a little kid doing like the cutest thing, you have a baby you know, doing something cute, and we just automatically yeah. pucker. Yeah. And so you asked earlier, uh, you know, what about beards? You're still going to see that bottom lip move up and out. Mm. And it depends, like, if there's a piece of anger, you might say, you know, you, like, there, it can, the emotions can combine with other emotions because we humans often feel more than one feeling at the same time. So if I teach you the main location of each emotion and you know that that's vulnerability and that's disgust, Hmm. you can see them when they put together. You're like, wait a second, that makes sense. 
somebody's really worried and upset about this thing that's happening. So when their micro expressions don't match what they're saying. That's, that's an indication that's that there's thing. lying, okay. that there's lying, that there's some kind of deception hmm. or at least, you know, not all lies are horrible. I, 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 I'm a mom. Some lies they just really don't want you to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> course in my family like it doesn't work like they catch they call me out i call them out yeah i mean i um i heard you say that your kids wrote a paper about what it's like to live in a house without lying all, about lying, all so. of my kids got into college with essays about what it was like growing up all of them different versions of like what it's like to grow up in a family where you can't lie to each other so let me ask you what is it like to grow up in a family where well, you can't lie to each other well i mean we call each other out on our shit mm -hmm. um nothing gets past us and so sometimes you have to allow other people their privacy. I mean, sometimes as a mom, I'll see them, yeah. you know, one of them is doing some tricky business and they just don't want to tell me about it. And if it's not dangerous, you, you got to give people their autonomy, just like in a relationship. You know, you don't want to, as a parent or as a partner or even as a friend, to be controlling all the time because people have the right to be awkward and embarrassed and... You know, we have the right to do some of our stuff by ourselves and fit, figure it out. But, I mean, my I, my son was like 13. I was just getting divorced and I was going to dinner with, um, with somebody that I'd known for a really, really long time. And it was, you know, there was history there. And, um, you know, I was no longer in the relationship with my ex-husband. And I, I said, it, you know, I'm going out to dinner with so-and-so. They knew who it was. Um, they hadn't met him. And they knew who he was to me in my past. And my son said, you like him, your pupils dilated. And mm. I was like, shit, <laughs> shit, damn it, he's right. A lot, most parents don't have to deal with that. No, no. and yeah. I was like, this was the dumbest plan ever. Like, I mean, you're definitely one of the few families in the world that that's, that's a real issue, yeah. right? Yeah, there's a guy yeah. named Paul Ekman who is a brilliant uh, behavioral scientist, uh, psychologist who's written about microexpressions and done like the most, as far as I know, thorough research and writing about it. And um, I, I'm sure I know it, he has at least one daughter and, and I'm like, I'd be interested in having a conversation about hmm. <laughs> what it was like for yeah. them too. It's probably, probably a similar experience, yeah. probably very similar. So you, you work with, you mentioned uh, before we started recording that you worked with a lot of powerful people. Why exactly are they so interested to work with you? So part of it was just that I started, I started in finance in Hong Kong and then I moved to Sweden and did management consulting. And then when I, uh, in, you know, later in my life, I started my own practice and did strategic advisory. So I didn't tell anybody that I coded microexpressions. So my, I built my career working with managing directors, CEOs, board, boards, um, management teams, and going into really high stakes negotiation and helping people solve really complicated people problems, whether it was with their partners or their employees or, or their clients. Um, and so the micro expressions, I didn't become public about that until I moved to the U.S. And decided, you know, my kids were sort of out of that age where, you know, I just wanted them to be hyper vigilant because I wanted them to be better protected than I was when they were young. And I, when I started talking about it, um, I got involved with a couple of membership organizations that got just completely obsessed with my skills and um, occupied a lot of my time. And it was mostly organizations that worked with CEOs and managing directors sort of all over the world. And anybody who is really interested in power tends to be fascinated with that extra layer of information mm -hmm. that micro express. It's almost like having x-ray vision. So I can, I listen to your words. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm making assessments and judgments and figuring things out and trying to figure out if we could form a partnership or a business together, if, if you know, if that's what we're interested in. But if they can have an additional layer of information that no one else knows and they can pivot in the, in the like it's almost like having – it's not thought bubbles, but it's feeling feeling bubbles. It's almost like they're subtitles where somebody's saying, no, this isn't what he really thinks. He really thinks this, this, and this. And and that stops me in my tracks in the middle of, an, of a negotiation. And I say, 
well, wait a second, what do you, do you think about the pricing? Well, actually, because we've got this, this, and this, that price is way too low. And we, we just make more progress with the negotiation and with the connection. All of my work is about connection and protection. And the other thing that I've noticed is that any place that is a conflict zone, they're obsessed mm. with whatever additional layer of um, skill they can have. That if somebody has no trauma in their lives and is fairly low in ambition, they're, they're happy with where they are, they're often not that interested in microexpressions. If they've got a high stakes traumatic situation, if you're working with kids that are under distress, if your teachers are particularly interested in it because there's so many kids that are having a hard time, how do I put words on my gut? I see that this kid is, is about to act out. How can I, yep, he puckered his chin, tightened his lips in anger. Maybe I can diffuse the situation before it escalates. Mm. Uh, working with criminals, working with um, catching ch child predators. It's yeah. super, super relevant because you're going to see the nice words. And, you know, my kids have identified pedophiles by, by coming to me and saying he shows contempt and disgust when he, when he talks to me. Mm. I mean, and that has um, saved all of my children at various times. Wow. And – so most of these powerful people, do you find that they tend to struggle with um, kind of not only reading the micro expressions, but just feeling empathy for or that kind of feeling? Because a good example is, let's say someone delivers um, or you're you kind of you get mad at someone as a as a CEO. Um, do they, do you find that they and like maybe you um, have an outburst at them? Do you find that they struggle with kind of? Like be able to read how the other person's feeling. Yeah, I think that uh, especially in corporate America, I wrote this in my book, a, a piece about the um, the rise to power is facilitated by the lack by lack of empathy. So lack of empathy facilitates the rise to power. Hmm. That people who have less empathy are able to care about what's going. You know, like, am I going to deeply offend this person when I step on their toes or take their idea or if I get to the project first and don't involve them or cut them out of a deal, like that's going to, you know, sharp elbows leads to, um, you know, I, I, like I, I've worked with CEOs who have like enormous amount of empathy and it, they're overloaded mm -hmm. with emotion and worry. But the rise to power, think about our politicians. How many of our politicians have deep empathy? It's it's rare, right? We're both showing disgust and contempt. We're both yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> and so I'm like, I don't know. And so it facilitates the rise to power. But when you have no empathy, you have not built those really deep connections where people are going to love you when you're out of the room. Hmm. Um, and you don't have people that are going to warn you. I mean, leaders – get so detached from what's going on around them because everybody to their face says yes and blows smoke up there, you know, and tells them everything they want to hear. And they lose, often lose connection with with reality and, and just have very, very little information. I mean, everybody laughs at their jokes. I know two yeah. – um, Two leaders that, that left organizations, one that was in an organization for eight years and one another one that was in another one for, for two years. And they can't get coffee dates or lunches. They ran these organizations. Mm. And they had positional power but not enough actual connections. And people are so fed up with them that when they retired and left those jobs, people will not go to lunch with them. Wow. So it was when they were out. It was when they're out of the professional environment that out they the that they understand how people actually right. feel about them. That's yes, like, wow. isn't that fascinating? Yeah. I want to say terrifying, but also kind of satisfying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That that um. So so there often is a disconnect with people in power, and I think there's an obsession that a lot of people that are obsessed with power, it's because they're not, or at least partly because they're not actually making connections. Hmm that that's how they get attention and validation from other people is through money and positional power. But what you find out, like you said, a lot of it's not not real. It's not genuine. Yeah. Right. Is that, and it makes us both really uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. But also a little bit satisfying because yeah. Yeah. karma, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think is the biggest misconception that younger people tend to have about being an adult or about adults in general? <laughs> that, that anybody has their shit together. Mm. Nobody.
Nobody has. I've heard I've heard that before. No, I mean, and like I get variations of that question. People sometimes will ask me, "What is the one thing that you really were surprised when you could sort of take away that veil and you got the X ray vision of reading microexpressions?" I was like, "Oh shit, everybody's struggling." Mm. And so if you realize that everybody is struggling, and even the most powerful people in the world struggle with self-love yeah. and, and feeling good about themselves and being happy and calm. Um, I think we're just human beings. We're, we're a mess. We're, we're just this vulnerable, weepy species. And yet what's almost more astonishing to me is that if you really look for it, the kindness is everywhere. So, you know, pick and choose who you spend time with and who you partner with. I get told all the time to, <laughs> to knock it off and stop only doing business with the people I love. And I'm like, and I, I like to do business with the people I love. Hmm. Why would I want to? It's a messy world out there. Why, If I connect with somebody emotionally and I trust them, I would rather work with somebody who's got a little less competency and a little bit more loyalty um, I don't expect humans around me to be perfect. I expect them to be flawed. I expect them to put up with some of my flaws. And if they make mistakes, that's fine. Mm. Come and tell me when you made a mistake. Let's figure it out together. What do you say to someone that is chasing a dream and just nothing's working? Nothing's going their way. So if you love it, that's that's part of running your own business. Mm. If you... Um, just keep trying and keep going. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be saying, like, is there another way forward? I think one of the things that I learned in living in so many countries is that um, I love the American entrepreneurial spirit. But when I grew up, there was this idea, if you didn't follow the road step by step by step by step and do what was expected of you, then you weren't going to get where you need to go. There's there's a hundred different ways forward. Mm. And sometimes it just feels like I don't know any entrepreneur, any person who started a business or started a mission that hasn't failed spectacularly multiple times, myself included. You know, and, and you have to, I mean, you certainly know this from all the things you've done, that you're putting yourself out there in a way that other people would say, I couldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And but can I tell you why I do that? Why? Because I care. Yeah. And there you go. So that it's uh when you I feel like when you when you care so much, you're willing to overcome that scare uh that fear of like putting yourself out there. I don't care about that because I just care about this too much to to not do it, you know. So then you just keep going. I mean, what what we talked about um uh, you know, I had several friends who went through divorces at the same time and None of us have had these evil husbands. It just, it just was, you know, there was no cheating in my marriage. There was, I, I was married to a kind person. It became, towards the end, like really clear that it wasn't a good fit. But it's incredibly painful to get out of a long relationship, especially when you've had children yeah. with that person. And so one of the phrases that um, my friends and I used, you know, we kind of were like dominoes. There were several of us that got divorced within a five-year period the only way out is through. Like if you find yourself in the dark woods, well, keep walking. Like yeah. keep keep going. And sometimes you can't – sometimes it's really hard with the networking and with all the different pieces to know which piece of the things you're doing when it comes to marketing or business are going to actually bear fruit. Mm -hmm. I mean I've done several things in the last two weeks and I'm thinking this is a total waste of my time. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Not this, obviously. This is so wonderful. But, but you, you kind of have to go through that, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, especially something I think about a lot, too, is you w when stuff's not working, pe people want to just, like, get, like, successful just like that. But when, when that happens, you won't, I don't think you have the legs to sustain it if, okay. you, don't, if you don't go through those years and years of, of not getting any views, of, of messing up, of making mistakes. Well, look what you're doing, though. I mean, in your in your specific case, um, I always find it easier to talk about the concrete. Mm -hmm. But but you are connecting. You're reaching out to different people, asking for advice. I mean, that is such a big important part is finding other like minded people who are doing things in their own but also different way, and um, and getting inspired by them, getting ideas from them, and connecting with them, and then. Getting used to saying, hey, do you know anybody else that you think I should connect with? So I would start asking if you haven't already, 
those questions in terms of making sure that you maintain the relationships after the interviews? I mean, you're probably doing some of this anyway, but already finding that, you know, just casting your your net really wide for me has made a huge difference because you just don't know which opportunities are really going to explode your business. Yeah. But part of it's just showing up and, and really working on something that you love. And for a lot of young people, that's hard to figure out what it is. If you know what it is, like the the doing is not the hard part. The figuring out is much harder. Figuring out what you love and what you're passionate about is so much harder than figuring out, okay, that didn't work. Let me try it this way. And then once you do figure it out, it almost comes to you naturally. Yeah. And, yeah. and you, you know, you, you can't learn a, a dance without falling on your, you know, yeah. without twisting your feet. Uh, we human beings, we, I mean, I, I remember being a, a mother, a young mother, and the young mothers around me were so obsessed with, it was a competitive thing, like when your kids started walking or when your kids started talking. And I was like, by the age of seven, they're all walking and talking, you know, most of them anyway, right? And you can't look at look at a guy when he's 19 years old and know that he started talking at this age or like that. It, it's, this, it's this ridiculous thing, but we learn through frustration. Humans learn to walk and they learn to speak because we get pissed mm. that we want to be somewhere where we're not and I don't have the skills to get there. So if you learned to walk or you learned to talk, you have the 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 balls mm. to to learn to do other things. Yeah. If you just set your sight on something and if it well if it straight doesn't work, then go round. Also the more the more you mess up, the more you're scared of fail or the less you're scared of failure. Well, right? Yeah. Well, because you because you survive, right? Yeah, and you get you do get used to it, but it's still. I mean, it that doesn't go away. Hmm. That it's. I mean, I cannot tell you. So I've been. I think I've gotten something like I counted at one point because I'm such a nerd. Twenty six million views on my socials in the last four months. Now, mind you, in August I didn't have. I think I set it up in like I, so July. I didn't have a TikTok, and I had an Insta that my daughter set up with like thirty followers. So. I knew what I had to do. I had to like take my spot on the world stage and stand up in a way that I also know how mean the inter the internet is. Like all these comments, yeah. I'm not used to that. I didn't grow up with that. And so I had to sort of stand up there and be like, this is this is what I can teach. I cannot teach people your age unless they find out who I am. Mm -hmm. And I can't give them the skills that they need and that I'm going to die someday. I don't know when. We're all mortal. And that hits you when you're my age. Yeah. Like, crap, what am I going to do that really is going to matter for the rest of my life? And uh, for me, it's teaching. And I cannot teach people if they don't even know that I exist. The social media stuff makes me so itchy. I can, mm -hmm. I can almost can't even talk about it without, like, wiggling my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm doing it. Is, is it scary? terrifying wow. and uncomfortable and all these like weird comments about like who's the old lady with no makeup <laughs> I'm like dude that's mean you know it's it's like yeah. i want to I, and because my trauma has to do with trustworthiness i don't like it when i can't see somebody hmm. when i'm visible but they're in a black box with no name that presses all my trauma buttons yeah that doesn't make it. So all these people that are critical and and strange, and I have been in life-threatening situations many times in my life. So I don't like it when there's a perceived threat that I can't see. I've developed my entire life on looking you face-to-face -face and knowing exactly what you're feeling. That's my survival skill. Hmm. And so if I can't use it, I feel all kinds of wonky and wobbly, but I'm still doing it. I think... That's also why um, when we were trying to set this up, you pushed so hard yeah. for in person. No. I think I tried to do remote and I think- um, Matthew was like, no, yeah. no, <laughs> that we know where you are. You're in Boston. Yeah. So I have done a lot of, um, but I, and the other piece is that I know that when I see somebody, it, I know that I connect, I have better chemistry and I do a better, like, you know, part of this is performance from both of us, right? Yes. It's more natural in person though. It's I feel like I've I've done so many remote interviews and it's it's very like robotic and like yeah. back and forth. But, well, and yeah. and my passion is born from trauma, but it's also so when I was writing it, very my best friend, who my daughter, one of my daughters, is named after. We were fiddling with 
the name of the book. And so I said, you know, one one name that was up was Annie Unfiltered because I have no filter. I'm terrible. Like I cannot have a glass of wine. I will tell you things I should like <laughs> never tell anybody. Yeah. I generally have I've so embraced this idea of being who you are. I kind of like I'm an overshare for sure. And so I knew my clients would be like, that's the funniest shit ever. Annie mm-hmm. Unfiltered. Like Annie's already unfiltered. Let me see what this is. But it didn't make sense to the people who don't know me. And she said, so I said, Diary of a Human Lie Detector, it really is the stuff that I'm almost horrified to share. And yet if I don't share what's real, like what what the hell am I doing? Mm. You know, if I, if I don't show what's real, I can't teach authenticity without being authentic myself. And I can't teach young people how to stay safe and protected and figure out who to invest in romantically, professionally, and platonically. Like who do you want around you as you build your life? Um. And so she said, you know, the irony, Annie, is that you're not a lie detector. You're a truth detector. You're obsessed with who you can trust and much less interested in who you can't. What would you say are some of the biggest regrets that you have from your 20s? I think not having um, – I think not having people around me that I could lean on enough – to stay out of unhealthy relationships. I think if I'd felt that I had, I had some good friends, but they certainly weren't grownups. I I think I didn't have any grownups around me that I could rely on. And I talked to my kids a lot about, you know, you can always come home and you can always rest and you can always stay and you can lean on me and I will help you. Like there's no trauma, there's no drama that is so big that you can't lean on your mom for a little while and we'll figure it out. If you had a minute with your younger self, what would you tell her? Stop trying to please everybody mm-hmm. and um, set boundaries. And you don't have to twist yourself into a pretzel to be loved. You can stand up and, and ask for what you want. I'm still struggling with asking clearly for what I want. And one of the jokes that my friends, my female friends and I say is it's the game where everybody loses is the game of guess what's inside my head. If you're in a romantic relationship or a business relationship or even with friends, ask for what you want and what you need. It feels so hard, and yet it really is so wonderful both to be able to ask for what you need and also to have somebody clearly say, hey, I need more space or I need less space or I need more attention. Just this beautiful thing, having a grown-up say, I'm really feeling lonely. I need some extra attention. And it's almost shocking how disarming it is. Just ask for what you want. Rather than trying to manipulate it or or get somebody else to guess it, we suck at guessing. Mm. 